My name is Andrew Beck, and this is the Behind the Frame series, a series where I share moments from the field with guests and take a look at the images that we captured, pull them apart by looking at the EXIF information, why we shot it and what led up to that moment, and then take you through the Lightroom editing process that I follow on the image. This week, we're going to be traveling to the Maasai Mara in Kenya, where we photographed a male lion and the lessons that I learned and shared with our guests out of this sighting. So, photographing lions is always exciting, except for 90% of the time when they're sleeping, because that's what they do 90% of the time. And that really was the case with the sighting that we enjoyed in Kenya's Maasai Mara last year. And we came across a lone male lion who was sleeping on a raised area at the edge of a quarry or a borrow pit in, um, towards the Ololalu escarpment. And it was a fantastic sighting in that uh, it had potential because he'd been sleeping the whole day, he had to get up and move, the wind was blowing, there was a bit of rain, um, but more importantly was where he was lying meant that uh, we had a very clean background and that we were able to separate our subject from the background. So I'm going to share a little bit of a clip with you guys on what the sighting was and the setup and then have a look at what transpired and how we finally got to what I believe was the shot out of the sighting. Here we go. So this was the scene. Um, beautiful herd of elephants in the background. Male lion on a raised section in the foreground. Wind blowing. The light was changing. We spent the better part of two or three hours, I think, before eventually he sat up and moved across. We repositioned the vehicle, and I'll expand on that in a little bit, and uh, managed to sit here and get that incredible angle and position with him in the frame. So I'm going to just kind of run through the process here. And male lions, they really do like to sleep, and this guy was no exception. He did, however, eventually, after all of our time and effort spent sitting waiting for him, sit up. And our initial position was spot on. This was the frame that I had kind of envisaged. We had the elephants out in the background. Um, we had him in the foreground here. And there was beautiful separation between the subject and the background. Um, the details here, this was shot at f3.5. So more than enough depth of field to maintain detail here and also then create this beautiful, soft, blurry background um, that we really strive for as wildlife photographers. Um, what we didn't count on was that after this moment, he was more intent in looking off into the distance. And so he didn't ever really look directly at us. It was then that I realized, hang on, maybe if we reposition and we drop down slightly, because the road did a bit of a, a, a drive down the, the slope below him, and he kept looking in that direction. If we were quick enough, we could get into a position where we could shoot back um, against him, put him against the sky, maybe include a little bit of the foreground. And it really fell in our favor because the light was fairly soft. It was overcast by the time that he eventually popped his head up. And um, we didn't have to deal with too much dynamic range um, that you would normally have when shooting a subject against a sky. So this is the final frame and I will show you how we're going to get there. So um, let's have a look at the details. I'm going to pull this up here. So 1 800th of a second at f3.5 and ISO 640. Zero exposure compensation here. And this is an interesting one. Um, if you have a look at the histogram, you'll see we haven't clipped any of the darks whatsoever, although they're still intact there. Um, so the reason for not wanting to overexpose in this particular instance is really because I want to try and preserve and balance not only the shadows, which is usually why you would be overexposing when you have a subject against a sky, but also because I want to preserve the detail that's in the sky. Now, normally if it's shooting in the middle of the day, everything just gets washed out. But this was late afternoon, it's a bit overcast. Look at the lovely colors that we're able to get here. And so from a neutral exposure composition perspective, We've still got a fair amount of detail in these shadow areas underneath the chin here. Um, we've also got all the lovely color and uh, detail of some of this band of clouds that's running in the background. 
Shooting at f3.5, a very shallow depth of field, and in this instance, it may not seem immediately obvious that it's also about blurring that background because it is just the sky, but it's also about blurring the foreground here. You'll notice lots of little vegetation um, in front of him and sometimes even in front of the nose. So there is a blade of grass running across the nose here. And of course, um, any wildlife photographer will know there's always a blade of grass, always. Um, so shooting at a very shallow depth of field here to try and separate that from the background. However, deep enough, not wide open at 2.8, just stopping down to 3.5, probably could have gone to f4 just to give a little bit more clarity here onto the ear. You can see this is all fairly nice and in, in focus. And then detail on these eyes, which is really the most important part of the frame. You've got to have those eyes nice and sharp. So that's why we didn't overexpose and lose too much detail in that sky or underexpose and lose detail in the midtones and shadows here. So from a neutral exposure perspective, very happy that that was the, 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 um, the right call. In terms of the shutter speed here, shooting 1 800th of a second, a little bit of breeze blowing, movement, um, the chances of him actually getting up and running and us needing anything faster than that um, is very slim. And then the ISO being at 640, obviously um, that would have adjusted based on the shutter speed and fairly low light. But in these, in these days, I think um, <laughs> you, you shouldn't be worrying about uh, ISO nearly as much as what you would have in the past. Right, so... Let's have a look. How do we start to process this image? And I'm going to run through it now from um, a Lightroom perspective and show you how I chose to get to the final image, um, which is, I think you'll agree, a lot of presents really, really like the overall look and feel. So let's have a look. So the first point here is that uh, maybe we could just look at just lifting the exposure just a touch here. I'm going to see, have a look at what happens in these highlights. If we pull back the highlights, you'll see that some of these washed out or the, the kind of lighter blues can be recovered to push them back. And it's important that if you have a look at your histogram here, you'll see that the blues, we haven't lost detail in those. If we had overexposed, the blue side would have started to climb up on here and we would have lost the colors in there. So by dropping the highlights a little bit, we we're able to bring back a little bit more of those lovely pastel blues into the frame. And then by substituting some of the highlights, uh, sorry, the shadows, we can lift those just a touch. And again, what I'm seeing on my screen compared to what's over on the recording screen here, everything's a little bit more contrasty. So I'll adjust my edit to give you a better idea of what I'm looking for. Um, and then from the whites perspective, you can see again the histogram, we can tease out some of those whites, looking to add back some contrast into these whites with the adjustments on the tone curve. Now, I know that a lot of people like to use the shift and double click on the whites and allow Lightroom to do that automatically. I prefer to have a look at the histogram and look at the overall look and feel of the image as well. And uh, that's just a personal preference and I do prefer to do that. Saturation, again, using the Canon system, I find that a standard value of about five is a good place to start and then adding in a little bit more on the vibrance. And you'll see that the vibrance slider really is going to pump the greens and the blues. So we've got to be careful that we don't overdo it here. Just looking at the overall color temperature, we could maybe just cool things down just a touch. And there we've got some lovely blues in the sky. Now, if we have a look at a before and after, you'll see what big adjustment is bringing back those shadows. And this is where the exposure chosen to start with is so important. Just lifting those shadows a little bit brings so much more presence to the frame, but we haven't also lost any of the detail and color in the sky here. So I'm very happy with where we're going so far. And again, not a, I mean, fairly ag aggressive adjustments on the side of the shadows, but um, I think well within our rights and well within what raw files can handle these days. Now, adding some contrast in the tone curve, Again, just lifting the lights a little bit or stretching the contrast in those lighter areas. Very little to be done in the darks and the shadows, but because we've lifted those shadows just to, um, quite aggressively, actually, I'm just gonna drop them a touch here. And before and after on that side of things, look at the difference that those lights make. And I, I know I keep saying this, but if you feel that your images are, are lacking something and you're not quite sure what it is, 
contrast in the tone curve really does just polish off the finished product and can really make a huge difference to the overall look and feel of your image. I'm going to go down into the detail section here. And again, we can use the 100% preview to spot that onto the eye. And then using the Alt and Option key as we slide out the details here. And this is an important one. So if you don't do this, have a look at all of the, the white in and around that sky. There's actually no detail there, but Lightroom is picking up edges. And that's not cool. We don't want to sharpen those. So if there is noise, especially when shooting at higher ISOs, it becomes very, very important that you pay attention to this. And now it's about finding the sweet spot. I like the detail that we're getting there. We're not really um, sharpening anything behind our subject or in front. It's really all just on the focal plane and the depth of field that we've chosen. So we can drop that in. We can lift the amount slightly because this is nice and full frame. We've got all the details. Um, and I think that is pretty much it. What I would like to do is looking on the screen there, he's looking a little bit um, orange. So what I'm going to do is on the hue side of things, I'm going to just check here the oranges and yellows. Let's just see. Can you see the changes? If I just slide this over slightly, you can see he goes from being um, a little bit more yellowy to a bit of orange minor adjustment and that's based on the screen that I'm seeing rather than the one that I'm, I'm actually editing on and overall I think we have a winner so before and after so the important thing here is to remember that the decision was made initially when shooting to not favor the shadows or the highlights but to consider them both and by keeping a neutral exposure composition, given the lighting situation, we were able to balance that, which meant that we were able to then recover the shadows in post-processing whilst not losing any of the detail in the highlights. Now, obviously, this requires the right kind of light. And if you're trying to do this sort of thing in the middle of the day with harsh, bright light or deep shadows, it becomes almost impossible. And that's so often where we end up with these high key black and white images of, let's say, for example, a giraffe underneath a balanite tree in the Mara or a um, battleur against a bright sky. The subject is in so much shadow that the exposure compensation needed is so aggressive that any and all color has been lost from the sky. However, if it's slightly overcast and there's a bit of a light source coming in and filling in your subject, you've got a much greater chance of being able to balance those exposures, have color and detail in your subject, whilst simultaneously protecting color and detail into that sky. And that's what we were very fortunate with here. Um, there were moments where the light popped and that again um, becomes quite difficult once that sky becomes very bright unless the light is falling onto our subject, as I discussed in the previous episode, where you've got good light falling on your subject and dark skies behind. That's just a photographer's dream. We didn't quite get that here, um, but we were able to achieve something quite special and unique um, by putting this, this male line against that fairly overcast neutral sky. Um, I think the, the other really big part of this image is the low angle, and it was that repositioning of the vehicle from our initial position where we were photographing this to just on the other side of this male line to shoot back at him. Um, and that really makes all the difference. It's, uh, there's a big trend at the moment around getting as low as you can, and especially now with animal eye focus on these cameras, you can get incredible results. Um, but I'd like to encourage you to think about doing that from the safety of your vehicle rather than always trying to push the limits or sneak out on the side. There are areas that you can do that and um, places like Mana Pools and Wangi where you can get down nice and low with elephants coming to water holes or feeding in the forests. Um, but always obey the rules. We were not out of the vehicle for the shot. This was just clever positioning and a lot of good luck which combined in order to give us the final shot. So in closing, again, our before and our after with the final edits of a male line from the Maasai Mara. I hope you guys have enjoyed this, uh, this episode and look forward to bringing more of the Behind the Frame series to you in the future. As always, you can drop me a mail with any questions. It's andrew at wild-eye.co.za or you can leave a comment on the bottom of the video or the blog post. And I look forward to sharing more incredible images and moments from Safari with you in the future. Cheers.